Well, I hope that you're standing down now. But uh, again, so, so good to see all of you here on the Sabbath. It is a special uh, day in a lot of ways because it's, look at the sunshine outside. Now, how could you not enjoy this Sabbath? You know, we, when we came through the Caldecott Tunnel uh, into Oakland down here, looked at the, the blue waters there and the Golden Gate uh, Bridge over there, it was just beautiful. The water, you know, looked just really blue. Uh, and I always enjoy that view uh, coming down. We usually exit there on Broadway and head on down uh, that way. Of course, the world is going the exact opposite of, of what God intends that we do. Oftentimes they do, don't they? You know, many people in the world today believe it doesn't matter whether you are a Christian because there are many roads to heaven. You know, you probably have heard somebody say that. There are many roads to heaven. You know, you, you got your way, I got my way. And, uh, you know, the Lord and, and I have a good relationship with one another. You know, of course, there are some people that actually believe you don't even have to be a Christian. <laughs> some think that, well, you could be a Muslim and you can go to heaven. <laughs> you could be a Buddhist, uh, or you can, you can be whatever religion it is, that there are many roads to heaven. As long as you are a moral person, just a good person, a good, decent person. Well, let's all just fold our Bibles up and head home, you know. You just got to be a, a decent person. I know when I was growing up, I, I knew a lot of decent people. I think my mother and father were very decent people. They didn't know the truth, though. They didn't know what God's Word said. You know, they were good Baptists. <laughs> Although, you know, in, in the South, by the way, being a good Baptist doesn't necessarily mean you even go to church. <laughs> uh, you maybe go every once in a while. You know, you want to go Christmas time or you want to go uh, Easter or whatever uh, holiday it is that you would go in. I guess you get all fixed up for the rest of the year. Uh, I remember uh, people, oftentimes they would die or pass away. Someone would say, well, he's a good old boy. <laughs> and you know, I, I, and they would usually talk about, well, I can picture him now. He's up there. He's probably having a, a cool one with Peter. No, no kidding. I mean, people would talk about, well, he, he's probably just laughing it up with Peter up there. Uh, you know, or one of the other uh, that is in a, up in heaven according to the, the way they look at it. I remember when my grandfather died, my grandmother thought she saw my grandfather, you know, uh, looking down from heaven at her. So he had gone to heaven. And of course, we realize and understand that, uh, in fact, the reward of the saved is not heaven at all. The Bible says that the meek are going to inherit the earth. <laughs> doesn't say that they're going to, to go up into the heavens. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to rule on the earth and that those are called now, the redeemed, according to Revelation 5 and verse 10, are going to be kings and priests on the earth. And so the reward of the saved is the earth and not heaven at all. But brethren, what does the Bible say about the idea that all you got to be is a moral person and you can go off to heaven or whatever it is you may believe, uh, you know, nirvana or whatever it might be that your religion uh, espouses or teaches? What does the Bible say about that? Is there a specific way of life that leads to eternal life? Is there a specific way of life? Again, what does the Bible say? Let's go to Acts chapter 9 over here and see what the Bible says. The church was not very old uh, when, in fact, the book of Acts was written. Luke, of course, the physician, was the author of this a book. He, he traveled with the Apostle Paul. In a lot of ways, the, the book of Acts is a, a, a book about the Acts of Paul and what the Apostle Paul did. But in Luke uh, chapter, in Acts chapter nine, I should say, in verse one, notice here, 
Uh, at the beginning, Paul, the Apostle Paul, was Saul of Tarsus. He was very educated, very erudite, had uh, quite, uh, you know, educational background, high up. You know, uh, in fact, in the, in the Sanhedrin, apparently uh, having power uh, in some sense there. But in, in uh, Acts chapter 9, in verse 1, it says, Then Saul, or Paul as he became later, later still, it says, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. So Saul was not on the side of, of this newfound religion. Uh, but, but was one who was against it. And notice, and, and asked letters from him, he went to the high priest who asked letters from him, to the synagogues of Damascus, so that he, if he found any who were of the way, of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound in Jerusalem. So he wanted to put them in prison or put them to death if they were following the way. Doesn't say a way, but the way, a specific way, in other words, of life. Let's go over to chapter 22 here. We see this all through the book of Acts. Kind of hard to miss, but a lot of people do miss these things that are sort of obvious in the scriptures. But in, in chapter 22 here, and by the way, a lot of our young people need to know these things. Some of the things some, that we take for granted, our young people need to know. Our young adults need to know there is a specific way of life that Christians are to live. Second, second, uh, 22nd chapter in verse 4. And Paul here, by the way, he was, remember, addressing this mob of Jews that had, had risen up against him. And it gained their attention because he was speaking in Hebrew, as verse 2 brings out. But notice, and when they heard that he spoke to them in Hebrew, they kept all the more silent. Because he, they knew he was very educated. And it says, then he said, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the top teachers of his day, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you are all today. So he was, he was brought up again uh, with the law. And he says, I persecuted the way, this way to the death, binding and delivering to prisons both men and women. So he says, I persecuted this way, this way. And again, he, he also was pointing out that he lived according to the strictness of the letter of the law himself, of the fathers. So he was one, again, that was, was following God's laws, and he persecuted the way that, in fact, was representative of, of the disciples of Jesus Christ. Now let's go to chapter 19 over here. Chapter 19. And of course God uh, struck Paul down, and he, uh, Saul down, and he became Paul after that. He was a rename uh, to be Paul. But in chapter 19 and verse 8, it says, And he went into the synagogue and he spoke boldly for three months. Here Paul is speaking in the synagogue, reasoning and persuading concerning things of the kingdom of God. So he started preaching about the kingdom of God. And when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way. They spoke evil of this way. Before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And so they spoke evil of the way. So there is a specific way the Bible talks about. Chapter uh, 19 here, verse uh, 23, just over from where you are there. But verse 23, it says, And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. It's interesting how, again, this is, stands out, doesn't it, as you go through the scriptures like this. So they spoke evil of the way. A lot of people speak evil of the way even today in our time. And sometimes we, we have given them reason to. 
unfortunately, <laughs> because of the things that have happened. What happened in 1995 when the church did not help us? Did not help us at all. And some things that have happened since, quite frankly, have not helped us either. Because Satan makes, you know, hay out of that. And uh, unfortunately, when people see it online, oftentimes they believe what they read. It's like people believe what they, they see in the newspaper. Must be true, it's in the newspaper. <laughs> Well, I, I hope that we understand that oftentimes newspapers are not very dependable. But uh, chapter 24 now, in verse 9, And the Jews, it says, also assented, maintaining that these things were so. And then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered and said, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of the nation. Here Paul is before Felix, remember? in defense of himself as he was headed on up to, uh, to Rome where he was going to be a guest of the, the emperor as a prisoner. But, but anyway, he, he pointed out how, in fact, that uh, Felix was quite aware, uh, having been a judge of the nation for uh, some time, he says, I, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself because you may ascertain that it is no more than twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor inside in the crowd, neither in the synagogues or in the city. Nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, according to the way which they call a sect, you know, the world is always, by the way, called the church a sect, a cult. So if you're looking for a church that is not a cult, then you're probably not going to ever find the true people of God. <laughs> and I would say absolutely you're not going to find the true people of God. Because in our modern age, the truth is, is stranger than fiction <laughs> in the world that we live in today. If people don't believe what the Bible says, and consequently, if you do believe what the Bible says, you are part of a cult. <laughs> so he says, I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. You get what he's saying here, brethren? Paul had not thrown out the Old Testament. <laughs> in fact, he told Timothy, he says that the Bible that existed then the scriptures that he, he told Timothy to pour over, to study, he says, will make you wise unto salvation. So Paul, uh, of course, adhered to the law and the prophets. He believed them. But, you know, again, they did not like the way, which included, of course, Jesus Christ. So brethren, clearly when we look in the book of Acts, again, this is right after the beginning of the church. The church was a specific way of life. And our way of living and life, brethren, is similar, very similar to the patriarchs. In fact, Paul himself in his writings points out these similarities. So we get over to the book of the Hebrews and, and you know, through some of the Paul's writing, we find that that Abraham lived a certain way of life, and in a lot of ways we are living the way that Abraham is living. Of course, with uh, additional understanding and knowledge that God has given to us. So there is a way, and it's called in the Bible, the way. Not a way, brethren. There, there is the way, there is the way to the kingdom of God. And of course, the kingdom of God is not going to heaven, but is going to a kingdom that is going to be established by Jesus Christ here upon this earth. Now my question to you, brethren, today, is are you living the way? Are you living that way? Are you living this way that the Bible uh, talks about? You know, the Bible is always brethren, talked about two ways of life. One of the things that Mr. Armstrong always did when he traveled uh, abroad and he went before uh, 
still amazing to, to reflect on that. He went before kings and magistrates and spoke, you know, before groups. He always went back that there are two ways of life. <laughs> you know, there's a way he used to, as you may remember, he described it as a way of get, and there's a way of give. Two, way of, two ways of life. And he would go back to Genesis chapter 2. And uh, a lot of times people would sort of roll their eyes and, and when Mr. Armstrong would do this, but, but, you know, we need to really go back to the very beginning. We want to find out what the Bible says. You've got to go back and look what, what was the beginning of this, you know, whole scenario. You can't know uh, where you are unless you see the beginning of something. Have you ever walked into a movie uh, in the midway? And people who do that, by the way, are some of the most irritating people. You know, now, why did he do that? Why did he do that? Well, if you had been here, you would have seen it. You know, because they missed the first part of the movie. Well, we don't want to miss that first part of the movie, as it were, uh, in the Old Testament. But let's notice over here, God created Adam. Here in, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, and it says, Then the Lord God, the eternal God, formed man of the dust of the ground. We, you know, Adam was red clay. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Or if you have a King James, a living soul. Man became a living soul. So God imparted life uh, to the man. And of course, God had this transcendental purpose for doing this. But how do you teach someone who is brand new? How do you do that? How do you teach somebody? And presumably, Adam and Eve were, you know, probably 25 or 30 years of age. I don't know how old they were, but, but they, they obviously uh, would have needed to be taught well, notice it says in verse 8, And the eternal God planted a garden eastward of, in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. But notice it says the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there were two trees in the garden. One was the, called the tree of life. And strangely, the other one was not called the tree of death. But it was called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the reason perhaps this is in the Bible is so we understand that if the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is about knowledge, then perhaps the tree of life is about knowledge too. The tree of life, of course, pictured revealed knowledge. It pictured also uh, the Holy Spirit that, in fact, it would allow somebody to have this revealed knowledge. The tree of, of, of the knowledge of good and evil, on the other hand, pictured death. What would lead to death? Well, death, by the way, doesn't... Uh, you know, come because somebody does all things bad, it's because we do some things bad. You know, when oftentimes in this world, uh, people uh, suffer because of this, the, 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 the things that they do. And I suppose it could be said that not everybody is completely evil. You know, but certainly upon this, this earth, uh, I would say most are going contrary to God's laws. And that's where they begin to pay the penalties. And that's what's happened to man for the last 6,000 years. But the true trees, brethren, pictured two ways of life here. The tree of life pictured, though, the way. The way to go. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, on the other hand, pictured a way to go. And that's the way that man has gone ever since. One way living in conjunction with God, the other way living ba basically your life as you choose, but contrary to God. One way leading to life, 
the other way leading to death. Now the problem with most people today when it comes to religion is they don't believe God really means what he says. But if God says that something's a tree of life and, and something else is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil and, and I think by extrapolation we could say it's the tree of death that God doesn't mean what he says. Remember he told Eve right there in the garden he said in the day that you take of this tree Satan uh, the serpent did. He said, said to Eve, in a day, you know, you, you, you take of this tree, you know, you, you, you're going to be like God. It, and it says, knowing good and evil. But God had said, if you eat of this tree, you're going to die. <laughs> you're going to die. But again, man has not believed God, have, has he? Hasn't believed what God has to say. The flood of Noah, by the way, is a testimony to the fact that God means exactly what he says. I mean, add it up, brethren. Add it up. Only eight people escaped dying in the flood because God means what he says. Because what man chose to do when he took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he was driven from the Garden of Eden... And he did not ha have access to the tree of life. Mankind chose to go that way so that only eight people escape the flood. Because God means what he says. And God started all over again with, with Noah and his family. You know, the, the flood is compared to, I believe it's over in 1 Corinthians 10, compared to a baptism. It was a baptism for the world. And Noah and his family came through the baptism. The baptism of the flood cleansed the earth. And uh, the world, and we can, I'm not going to go there, but in Genesis uh, 6 it talks about how that the, the world was corrupt. corrupt. And the world was, was filled with violence. And Noah found grace in the eyes of God because he was upright. In other words, he was living righteously. He was pure in his generations, according to what the scriptures uh, say there. And, you know, one of the, the things that Noah uh, was good with is he had a habit of listening to God. <laughs> over here in chapter 7, Genesis chapter 7, let's notice over here, God had given him all the instructions about what he was supposed to do Notice here in verse uh, 1, we'll start here in chapter 7 in Genesis. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous be before me in this generation. Now think about this, how corrupt the earth must be. That God would wipe out every human being upon the earth, except Noah and his family. But he says, you're righteous. And you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. And, and you know, the, the uh, instructions that were given here. But in verse 4, for after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things I have made. But notice in verse 5 what it says. And Noah did according to all that the eternal commanded him. You see his habit? <laughs> he did what God said. Now brother, sometimes we have a problem with that, don't we? Sometimes we don't do what God says and, and you know, it's like, you know, we, we find ourselves in trouble because we, we don't, don't do what God says. The best thing, brethren, is to get into habit. And, and uh, we need to teach our children, as, as the first message we're talking about. And I hope that our young people will, will take the gauntlet up. I hope that you will realize that the baton is going to be, it is being thrown in your net lap. You have a responsibility. And I'm sure that your parents, your mother, your father, and brothers and sisters that are in the church would like to see you uh, carry on with the truth of God in the way of God. 
that God has, has given you the tremendous opportunity to know. Let's go over here to, to uh, chapter uh, 3 of, of 1 John. And 1 John over here, go back into the New Testament. When, when in fact, John, the Apostle John, who was that beloved Apostle, but in 1 John chapter 3, on down here in verse uh, 19, and it says, By this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before us. But if our heart condemns us by the things that we do, of course, how we live, whether we're living according to God's way of life, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And if we have the forgiveness of God, if we know that we've repented, we've asked God to forgive us, we know we have the confidence of God. We have His favor. But notice in verse 22 here, And whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Why? Because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is co his commandment, that we should believe in, on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So God has given us the commandment to have love for one another. But the way we get God's favor, the way that, that Noah received God's favor and he escaped the time of the flood is because he obeyed God. He did those things that were pleasing in the sight of God. You know, brethren, it's impossible to please God without obedience. You just can't please God without obedience. There's an old memory scripture, uh, Hebrews 11 and verse 6, that says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Got to have faith to please God as well. You know, we, you could give an entire sermon, by the way, on these subjects about how in order to please God, we've got to obey God. We've got to have faith in God. But it, it goes on to say in Hebrews 11, verse 6, it's for he that comes to God must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So God will reward us, brethren, if we diligently seek him. You know, when we move from the time of Noah uh, clear to the time of Abraham, what do we find in Abraham? A man that was really, uh, you might say, uh, the exact same character as, as Noah had. When it came time that God was going to make of Abraham a great nation, and he was going to bestow upon him these national uh, birthright promises and and, and uh, the many blessings that would come spiritually that would emanate from Abraham. Why did he, what did he, he, he talked about when, when in fact he made the decision to do that with Abraham, why he was going to do that, why he was going to use Abraham and, and Sarah, you know, that were going to be used to bring about a, a people that would multiply, uh, would multiply into the millions and, and uh, like the stars of heaven. But God said, why was because that Abraham obeyed my voice. <laughs> he kept my charge. In other words, he did what I asked him to do. He kept my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. You see, if we obey God, we, that pleases God. And we have God's favor. And someday we may very well be, brethren, in a Noah position. And it may be sooner than you think. We may be in a situation where we're escaping. The only hope that any of us will have will be whether we have God's favor. And brethren, it's high time we realized the time that we're living in. The serious times that we're living in. We've always felt we lived in the end times. I, at least I have since I came into the church back in the 60s. <laughs> and I was in the end time. 
But we have to understand, brethren, uh, you, there's going to come a time where, when, when the trouble's right, you open the door, it's there. <laughs> and we're, I think we're closer to that than we realize. You know, God has a habit, brethren, of blessing those that are obedient to him, that have faith in him. And this is exemplified through the lives of all of the patriarchs. You can go through every one of them. Noah, Abraham, Moses, you know, David, just to name a few. They were men who were faithful, and of course, women who were faithful as well. And throughout the Old Testament that form what we refer to as the saints of God, both in the Old and the New Testament. And the saints, brethren, are going to inherit all things. They're going to inherit eternal life. Now, they're not going to go up to heaven, but they're going to be up on the earth on, during the time of the kingdom of God, and they're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. And people of the way know that, by the way. If we are of the way, we know what is the future of those who are the saints of God. When Jesus came teaching, he spoke of a parable, a parable about the way. It's kind of interesting, a, a thought. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7 over here, oftentimes when you go to a, uh, uh, if you ever go to a, a place where somebody very wealthy lives or has lived, don't they usually have big, great, big gates out there? <laughs> I've been to some of the palaces, and I'm sure you have as well. Buckingham Palace, you know, is a very, uh, the gate is quite impressive, isn't it? And uh, especially those guys that stand at attention outside, you know. Uh, there are a lot of fanfare, but they're big gates. Uh, sometimes you will see, in fact, the, the rich that have these, these big gates, and they've got this long causeway, this long road that goes up to their palatial mansion <laughs> that is there. And you've got trees usually on either side of it, a big, big broad way, you know, with sometimes fountains along the way. And you get up there and usually, you know, you, if you're uh, in a car, you, you know, you've you, you got to drive around the fountain that, you know, is huge and, and the water just shooting up all over. Now, I haven't met many people like this, by the way, in my life. I've been uh, uh, in, in places that look that way. Uh, never knew anybody that lived in those kind of places. But, but I've been in a lot of uh, places where poor people live through the years. Usually when you go to see a poor person, if they have a gate, <laughs> uh, it's an old wooden uh, gate that somebody tacked together. And uh, I went to see somebody, in fact, not long ago here, up in Santa Rosa area. And it's like they, I, the latch was, I'm not even sure what it was. It might have been a string. And you got a, a sort of a windy path to their, their place. And, uh, you know, it's not, a, not even paved. It's not, it doesn't have a concrete or anything like that. It's just a path. You know, like where, you know, a deer might walk. <laughs> Not impressive at all. So the rich person has the big gate, the, rot, the wide way. Poor person, well, he's got a, a terrible gate. Uh, most people wouldn't really necessarily want to walk through uh, in, in a trail up to his house. But let's go to Matthew chapter 7 here. Matthew chapter 7. Well, on down here in, in verse uh, 12. Here Jesus said, Therefore whatever you want men to do, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Jesus Christ didn't come to do away with the law of the prophets. You know, but as we know, he came to magnify, as in fact he says later. But verse 13, he says, Enter by the narrow gate. The narrow gate. You know, don't go through the rich man's gate. The big broad gate. Or in a mental great gate. But enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, 
And difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. These hidden places. Of course, the, the truth of God, the way of God, is called a mystery in the Bible. A mystery. Mystery to the world, at least. Shouldn't be a mystery to us. But the way of truth, brethren, the way is through the narrow gate. It is through the difficult uh, way. Maybe, maybe uh, sometimes uh, the way uh, is sometimes treacherous even. How many of you saw the, the movie, uh, this is go back many, many years, Horizon, Lost Horizon? Now some of you may or may not have heard of it, but you know, to get to this, uh, this place where it was sort of a, you know, a place where it, it, no one ever aged or anything in this particular uh, movie that I saw it was a color version of it uh, made later. They've got one that goes back, of course, uh, uh, I think probably back in the 30s or so. And then they did a remake. They did, you know, the, everything's a remake. They re remade everything. They, you know... I like the old King Kong movie, by the way. <laughs> They've remade that thing to death. Uh, but, uh, but, but Lost Horizon, though, to get to this place where, you know, people are happy and joyful and you got, you know, fountains and falls and place, you have to go through a treacherous route up into the snowy mountains and, and through a tunnel in order to get to this place. Well, God's way, again, is not, not a straight shot, it's not the, not the big gate, not the broad way, but it's the narrow way, it's the difficult way. And Jesus Christ said that most people are going the broad way, that is going to end in death. Now, when Jesus Christ came, brethren, he came to epitomize the way. He came to epitomize it, to... To be an example of the way. You want to walk in the way? You got to look to Jesus Christ, our Savior. I'm not going to turn to it, but in John 14 and verse 6, I'll just quote it to you. Jesus said, he was talking to his disciples, but he said, he said, I am the way, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And further he says, no man comes unto the Father, but he says, by me. You see, the only way to the Father is by Jesus Christ. So Christ is the way. He is the truth. I'm sure that didn't set well with the, if Jews, you know, uh, heard him say this, but he, he was the way. So what should we be doing, brethren, to walk in the way? How should we be living? What, how should we live, brethren, to walk in the truth as God's people? Wouldn't it make sense to follow Jesus Christ if he is the way? You might say Jesus Christ is our guide through these, this narrow gate, in the treacherous and difficult way to the lost horizon. This place where people never die. Where there's happiness and joy. And of course it's not a movie, it's real. It's a real way of life. It makes sense again to follow his example. How did he live? How did he live? Well, he was like the average Jew of his day. You know, he would have observed, of course, dietary laws. Uh, and never, ever did Jesus Christ ever give anybody the impression otherwise in his entire life. I mean, if, if the Jews were upset because they thought he was breaking the Sabbath, uh, I, I don't think that, that probably they would have reacted very well if he had been chomping down on some lobster. <laughs> that might have upset them. <laughs> I think it would have certainly very much upset him, and he didn't do that. He lived according to, to the dietary laws. He did these things, brethren. So he's like the average Jew of his day in that regard. 
And, you know, according to scriptures, Jesus Christ, you know, oftentimes quoted the writings of David, King David. He mimicked uh, the life of, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Uh, obviously without the, the mistakes that, the, that were made, but because Christ was absolutely flawless. But, but brethren, Jesus Christ is the path, the path, the way. And he says you can't go to the Father unless you go by him or through him. And brethren, if we cut the Father off, and oftentimes people do in the world today, if you cut the Father off, you lose Jesus Christ. Some people believe, uh, again, only in worshiping Jesus Christ. But if you cut the Father off, you lost Jesus Christ. And if you cut Jesus Christ out, you lose the Father. You know, Jesus Christ, we're told in John 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus Christ, in fact, was the one who was the Word. Because it says in verse 14, in John 1 verse 14, that he came, became flesh and he dwelt among us. And that Greek word, by the way, for, for uh, the word that is used, a word, is from the, the Greek logos. And as we've understood, that means spokesman. So as the Word, the one who became Jesus Christ before was the spokesman for God. And of course, uh, when Jesus Christ came, he was the only begotten of God. And so the God is the Father. And so Jesus was the spokesman for God. He was the spokesman for the Father when he came. In fact, no one knew about the Father. Christ came to reveal the Father. And as God's emissary, Jesus was sent to do that. He was the Logos. He was the spokesman. It's logical, again, that he would go, come and do that. But let's go over here and notice in, in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, just over from where you are there. Matthew 11, in verse 27. Notice what Jesus says. He says, all things have been delivered to me by my Father. He could have just as easily said, by God. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And the one to whom the Son wills to reveal it. And of course, this is what the disciples were about. He revealed it to the disciples of the early church. In Ephesians 2, verse 18, I won't turn there, but you might want to write that uh, in conjunction with Matthew 11, verse 27. It says in Ephesians 2, verse 18, For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. It's through Jesus Christ, by the way, that we can actually go and talk to the Father. And all things, you know, should go through Jesus Christ to the Father. So when we pray... We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, or by his permission, or his authority. Remember, Jesus told Pilate that he came into the world to bear witness to the truth, and those of the truth hear him. Of course, those that were not of the truth, you know, worked to kill him. And were angered with him. Let's go to John 8. John chapter 8 here. So Christ came to again to show the way. And that way included showing who the Father was. But in John uh, chapter 8, chapter 8 and verse uh, 32 here. He says, and you shall know the truth. Again, notice it says the truth, not a truth. <laughs> but the truth and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, he said, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. And strangely, of course, 
it's hard to understand how they make these statements since they were under bondage to the Romans. <laughs> And it says, how can you say you will be made free? And Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So we're no longer, again, under the bondage of this world. And who is the ruler of the world right now? It's Satan. You know, according to 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan is the God of the world. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, when we become a part of God's church, brethren, we are under different uh, leadership. And that is we are in God's government, in his church, which is the Israel of God. Uh, Israel, of course, was, was God's nation. Uh, today it's a spiritual nation based upon uh, those who are converted. But, you know, God wants us to realize that Jesus Christ came to set us free, and by following his example, we can be made free. In, in 1 Peter 2, verse 21, the Apostle Peter says, For here, even hereunto you are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. So Christ came to set an example just for the purpose, brethren, of you and me walking in his footsteps, following his example. And when you are baptized... When you have the laying of hands and the Spirit of God is imparted to you, brethren. Paul said this about himself. He says, I am crucified with Christ. That's what happens when you get your baptized. You're crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. No, so we're a living sacrifice. Yet not I, but Jesus Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we have Christ in us who is the way. He's the truth. How could we live in a, in a way? You know, there, there's only one way. And that is the way of Jesus Christ. That's the way of Jesus Christ. How Jesus Christ walked. And there's so many analogies, brethren, to this in the Bible. Let's go to John uh, 15, over from where you are there. In John 15, over here, notice this. Notice, uh, all of us, of course, are very familiar with this, this uh, parable here, but, but it says, I am the true vine. Christ said, I'm the true vine. And, of course, the vine, doesn't it, it supplies the nourishment uh, to uh, whatever grows on that vine, and if we use the analogy of grapes, as long as the you know the sap is getting to uh, you know the the grapes, they're going to grow, aren't they? As long as it's attached to the vine. In fact, it's necessary to be attached to the the, the vine. So Christ says, "I am the true vine. My Father is the vine dresser." So He said, "My Father is the one that prunes the vine." <laughs> He's standing out here with the, the, you know, the, the snippers. I used to actually uh, pick grapes down in Southern California, by the way, when I was about uh, 16. And uh, I was like everybody else. Uh, you know, I grabbed a bucket, went out, and you try to get un and under the, the, uh, the vine uh, because it's hot. <laughs> I remember when I, like, came out of here, by the way, and, and it was 1966, I, back in those days. And, uh, and I thought, who in the world would live out here? Uh, and especially when I was under the vine. You know, I thought, why am I here? You know, and, but I had the, uh, and I was being paid uh, to, uh, to cut grapes. They give you a little, uh, very sharp uh, tool, you got to be careful with it. Uh, and you just cut the the clusters of grape. 
down, throw it in your bucket, and carry it up to the truck. They put it in, put it in the truck. Uh, I say you got to be careful because I had a, a uncle who's about my age, wasn't careful with a sharp tool, <laughs> and he cut his arm. Oh. And uh, he, he was sort of a guy that nothing ever bothered him, you know. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Gets hit by a Buick, forget about it, you know. <laughs> Uh, he cut himself, and uh, because he was such a t tough guy, uh, you know, I'm 16, he's probably about 17 or 18, but, <clears throat> but anyway, he cuts himself, and it wasn't that bad, but he looks at it, and it, a little blood comes out, and man, he, he passed out, <laughs> and I hate to tell you, brother, and I laughed. <laughs> uh, Mr. Tough Guy didn't last very long. Uh, my sister was that way. If she saw blood, man, she would faint at the drop of a hat. You show her, mu uh, show her ketchup, she faints, you know. But uh, and uh, with with you know six boys, you can imagine how much fun we had with that. But uh, but anyway, uh, but but I I know again uh, what it's like to to do this. But what a, what a, a pruner does. And I was cutting the grapes. I wasn't. I guess in a way you could say I was, I was pruning the tree or a pruning the vine. But going on, it says, every branch in me that does not uh, bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes and it may bear more fruit. So here's the father. Again, he's got this sharp tool and he's cutting off the things that are not bearing fruit. And he said, you are already clean because... Of the word which I have spoken to you, abide in me and I in you. And this branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You can't bear fruit by yourself. Unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Got to be hooked up to that vine to bear fruit. Is what yeah, the message is here, brethren, for us. And it says, I am the vine, you are the branches, verse 5. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them in the fire and they are burned. We don't want to be a part of that. But it says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Again, God favors those that are willing to walk in in his way. And God wants us to realize we've got to be attached to Jesus Christ. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And our lives, brethren, should ref reflect that fruit that was in the life of Jesus Christ. It should reflect the fruit of God's way. You know, Jesus Christ himself said, I've come that you would have life and have it more abundantly. That life would be brimful and run over uh, for you. That life would be exciting. And brethren, as long as we are tied into the vine, our lives will be that. They'll be joyful. And certainly we all are going to have hard times, difficult times. But as I look over the years of, of, of our lives, uh, you know, my wife and I have been together and those times prior to even before we got married, it's like since I came into the church, you know, my life has been abundant. It has been full. And I expect more ahead. And the biggest is yet to come, right? For all of us. Why we're here, in fact. We're waiting for the, 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 the uh, not necessarily the finale, but the, the climax that's going to occur when Jesus Christ returns and we're changed out of these old feeble bodies that we have. They get more feebler every day, if feebler is a word. Uh, but, uh, but you get the point. <laughs> you know, we, we, it seems like our bodies don't do what they used to do. You know, I can't twist and shout like I used to. <laughs> if you twist and shout too much, you might get a hitch and a get along. But going on, verse 8, it says, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Again, following the path of Jesus, what, what Jesus did. 
as God's people, we, we need to do that. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. And notice one of the things that Jesus Christ said to do here. Again, make a habit of doing what God says. Of obeying God. He says, you, uh, he says abide in my love. Now how do you abide in the love of Jesus Christ? He goes on to tell you how. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. I mean, how, how much clearer can you get than that? Just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. You want to have the full joy of God. Walk again in the way, in the truth, and in the life. Following the example of Jesus Christ. And brethren, if we, we're going to bear much fruit if we keep in the commandments of God. <laughs> Striving to understand not only the letter, but the spirit of it. <clears throat> the more we understand the spirit of it, brethren, the more we understand Jesus Christ. Now what was the example of Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus Christ set the example of love, didn't he? <laughs> The Father set that example as well. In Romans 5 verse 8, I won't turn there, but it, it, it talks about how God demonstrates his love for us because that, you know, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Jesus Christ died for us. He gave his life for people that, that had sins. Jesus Christ, of course, was completely sinless. But brethren, are we, again, thankful for that love he's shown to us? Or are we abiding in that great love the Father has shown us for what he has done for us, what he's given to us? Now let's go back over here to uh, John 15 in verse 13. John 15, verse 13. It says, Greater love has no man than this, that to lay down one's life for his friends. You can't have any greater love than that. Are you laying your life down for your brethren here in this congregation? You laying your life down for them? Are you giving of yourself to one another? Are you going out of your way to help somebody else? Are you striving to be a friend to more than just a couple of people? You see, are you laying your life down? And notice verse 14, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father I've made known to you. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you could go forth and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. So Jesus set the example, brethren, of love, didn't he? How loving, again, are we as God's people? How, how loving are we to, of one another? We, hopefully we have the, the common faith. If we can't love each other, then who can we love? <laughs> who can we love? We're certainly going to have a hard time relating, aren't we, on the job with somebody that doesn't know the truth. <laughs> and yet we're supposed to show love toward all mankind. You know, everyone we should be showing love for. The Father gave everything, he gave his Son. And Jesus gave everything. Everything he gave himself. And you know, we, in a, w a lot of ways, we have liberty in, in the faith that the people in the world do not have. We, we've been freed from the bondage of this world and the society. We don't have, brethren, eternal death hanging over our head like the world does. God's taken that away as a result of our baptism. That's what the baptism is all about. God takes away, again, eternal death. And we, we, in fact, are given an opportunity for life. 
And we, we live a new life when we come up out of the, the baptismal uh, tank. We walk in newness of life. And that life has a future. The life of, of the average Tom, Dick, or Harry walking the street, brethren, has no future <laughs> to it. They may be making a, a ton of money. <laughs> they may be basking in, in wealth so that they have the big gate and the long driveway and the big fountain and the, and the trees on each side like I described. They may be really doing well, but they don't have the opportunity you have. They don't have the liberty that you have. And there's so many liberties we have, brethren. We can be free of the headaches of the world. So many headaches uh, that are out there. That's what caused me to want to be a part of something bigger. I wanted to know the answer. I, 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 I think I've mentioned this more than once. That when I was, by the time I was 16, I said, God, I've made a mess of my life. And you can have the rest. You can do anything with it. I'm not going to go to Galatians 5 verse 13. I encourage you to read it later, but, but I'll quote it to you. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. You've been set free. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Sure, you could go and do something and ask God's forgiveness. He would forgive you for it. You know, that has diminishing returns for you, by the way. You do that much. But, but God would forgive you. God's very willing to forgive. But, but he says, don't use your liberty as an opportunity to flesh. Don't do that at all. But through love, he said, going on, serve one another. Use your liberty to do good things. Don't be munching off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Use your liberty to do good things in your life. To serve, to help, to pitch in, to do the work of the living God that has to be accomplished and done. You know, the Apostle Peter says this, he says, Above all things, being fervent in your love among yourselves. For love covers a multitude of sins. And he says, using hospitality one to another without murmuring. <laughs> if you've got the opportunity, you've got the, got the facilities where you can have people in your home, be thankful. <laughs> Somebody else might not be able to do that. Show your love toward your brethren, brethren by extending your hand and helping someone. You know, reaching out and... and being an encouragement to them. So Jesus set an example of love. Uh, also, I'm not going to, to spend a lot of time on this, it was the manner of Jesus Christ and the custom to keep the Sabbath. Luke uh, 4 verse 16 tells us that he was, it was his manner to enter into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. You know, the synagogue was merely a place uh, where the Jews worshipped Unless we think we got to go to the synagogue. It's, it was a church building. And he went there, uh, and that's where oftentimes the law was written, uh, read as well. So Jesus kept the Sabbath. And we know that, that Jesus Christ uh, was accused of breaking the Sabbath, but he did not. Oftentimes Jesus Christ would say to the Pharisees, accused him of breaking the Sabbath, Have you not read? <laughs> Have you not read? No, they, they were interpreting the laws of God in, in properly. He wasn't breaking the Sabbath. In fact, Jesus Christ is, is the Lord of the Sabbath. He was the one that instituted it back in the book of Genesis. The seventh day, of course, was that day of rest given uh, at the time that Adam was created and mankind came into being. And the Sabbath, according to Exodus 31, is a sign of God's people. If you want to find God's people, that people that are in the way, it's impossible unless they're keeping the Sabbath. <laughs> it's impossible. So the first thing you look for is, are they keeping the Sabbath? Next thing you look for is what another thing that Jesus Christ did besides the Sabbath he kept the feasts of God. 
Uh, over here in John, let's go to John. Uh, I think you're already in John, but let's go to John 7. In John 7, and by the way, the book of John was written after the other uh, Gospels were written. It was a later edition, as it were, uh, from John because of troubles that had, had arisen. And when he wrote it, he wrote it uh, in hindsight much uh, more than, than uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But in verse 7, notice, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. As opposed to what the church was doing, this was the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. The church was observing the Feast of Tabernacles, but this was the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. And his brothers therefore said to him, Depart from me uh, from here and go into Judea. And in your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. Verse 4, For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. But it says, for even his brothers did not believe in him. So when they were saying, uh, they were saying snidely, you know, you got to go, go up there, show yourself. You know, don't, do, don't be in secret. Go up and show yourself. Because they didn't believe. They were sort of being smart mouth, as oftentimes brothers can be with one another. And Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of that which, which uh, works, uh, of, of its works that are evil. You go up to the feast and I am not going up to this feast for my time has not yet fully come. So what did Jesus Christ do? He knew, of course, the Jews would seek to kill him. But let's, let's go to verse 10. And when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. So Christ went up to the feast. <laughs> Why? Because he kept the feast. <laughs> he kept the feast of tabernacles. And John is mentioning this to show that we, of course, in the church kept the feast of tabernacles. And there are other scriptures that show that the other festivals were observed uh, by the way. But John writes about this. It would have been a golden opportunity for John to say, oh, by the way, we don't have to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. <laughs> but the Jews were. <laughs> no, but he doesn't. He tells again about it here. But, you know, we see again uh, in, in this account that Jesus Christ kept the feast. And then on down here, let's notice, uh, you know, in, in verse, uh, verse 14... And now the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. So he was there at the beginning. He was there at the middle. And then let's notice over here in verse, uh, verse 37. And on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So he was there at the beginning, the middle. He was there at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. So he kept the Feast of Tabernacles. So if you want to find God's people that are in the way, you've got to find the people that are keeping the feast of God. Now, by the way, there are many things that you have to look uh, for to find God's people. But these are examples that Jesus Christ, we see, clearly set. He set an example of prayer. You know, in Mark 1, verse 26, it says, In the morning, rising up a great while before the day, went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. But Christ often went out early in the morning before the sun was up, and he prayed. And, you know, he did that often. He would go up to the mountainside uh, in the evening and pray. He would go out early in the morning. And uh, one occasion, mentioned in Luke 6.12, it says he went up into the mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. Sometimes it's good, brethren, to take time to pray a long time about something. And this was something, obviously, that, that Jesus Christ prayed about a good long time. Talked to his Father in heaven. He taught his disciples how to pray. 
as well. They came to him and they said that, you know, teach us to pray. And in Luke 11, you know, Jesus Christ told them how to pray. So Christ set an example of prayer. You want to find those of the way, you find people that pray. Christ also, brethren, set an example of suffering and sacrifice. Suffering and sacrifice. He was a sacrifice for us, and he gave his life for the sins of the world. And brethren, we must be willing to endure and suffer as living sacrifices ourselves. You know, we are to be like Christ. We are to be like-minded as Christ was, who emptied himself, as it were. He didn't think it was robbery to be equal with God, according to what it says in Philippians 2. But he emptied himself and came in the form of the servant, and he gave himself, in fact, through death when he was crucified. For us, all of us. He was a great sacrifice for us. And when Jesus was keeping the first Passover with the disciples, he did something that was rather extraordinary. Over in John 13, in John chapter 13, he knelt down and he started washing their feet. We're going to do this not too long from now. Uh, at the Passover, there's going to be uh, around April 20-something. Uh, I think the 20, what is it, 21st? I think that's the, the date uh, of the Passover this year, which will take place here, by the way. But, but, but anyway, uh, Jesus Christ, again, set an example of uh, kneeling down and washing the disciples' feet. And after he'd done it, notice in verse 12, and when he'd washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, if I then, your Lord and your teacher, has washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example. There again, he was the way. That you should do as I've done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. Nor is he who is sent greater than he has sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So Jesus Christ, brethren, said the example for us. And we're told by Paul's writings too that if we are willing to suffer with Christ, if we're willing to, to sacrifice with Christ, we're going to be glorified as well. We're going to be co-heirs with Jesus Christ. We're going to be glorified. So brethren, contrary to what many people believe, there are not many roads to heaven. But there is one way. There is the way. God's way is a specific way of life. Don't let anybody kid you. Don't let anyone, you know, try to dissuade you from the way that God has revealed to you. It's very clear in the scriptures. It, it is the way. And Jesus Christ is the way. He epitomizes the, the way. It is a way that is, that is a narrow way, a difficult way. But you know, this doesn't lead to death, but it leads to the kingdom of God. And brethren, all the beautiful, wonderful things about the millennium that are going to, to be ahead of us. So let's make sure that again, we're living in the way.